my name is Haley Schust and I'm a Senior Accessibility Specialist at Salesforce. Thanks for joining me in this ATD Toolbox Tip. Before we get started, I want to set expectations. This Toolbox Tip is not going to give you step-by-step -step instructions for how to create an accessibility checklist. It will, however, overview crucial factors for creating a usable accessibility checklist. I want to emphasize the importance of an accessibility checklist before I go on. This is a topic I could ramble about for hours because I feel so strongly that anyone creating content or managing people creating content should have a checklist. Accessibility checklists promote inclusive user experiences. They ensure content is compliant with standards and the final product will be usable for all audiences. Though most commonly used for a quality assurance or post-developmental assessment, an accessibility checklist can also be referenced early in the design phase or set expectations during discovery. A common objection to an accessibility checklist is usually time. And I'm not going to lie to you, incorporating an accessibility review into your design process will absolutely extend your timeline at first. You see, designing for accessibility becomes easier with more repetitions. Over time, you'll likely find that you inherently build an accessibility uh, consideration into your design. For example, personal example, I have developed a keen eye for color contrast. I pride myself on that. Now, that doesn't mean that I no longer use a color contrast checker in my testing. I most certainly do. But I don't need to reference the checklist to know I have to test for color contrast. It's something I've inherently built into my process. So no longer does it extend my timeline. It's just something that's a part of my process. Hopefully that's enough to sell you on the idea of having a checklist. Now let's get into some factors that you'll want to consider when you build your first checklist. Priority number one, you'll want to determine which standards you want your checklist to align to. Generally speaking, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG or WCAG, are the gold standard because they are international. However, if you're based in the US, you may prioritize the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA. Or if you're designing for an organization in Europe, aligning with EN 301549 will be critical. If you're unfamiliar with accessibility standards, then you might want to consider starting small. Select a few practices and perfect applying them before expanding the scope and complying with all the different accessibility standards. In my own accessibility journey, I started with a few basic requirements for all courses and content I was creating. Number one, informative images must have alternative text. Number two, videos must have closed captions and transcripts audio must have transcripts, and three, all user interactions require instructions. As time went on, I began to add items to this checklist, such as requirements for heading hierarchy, color contrast, and descriptive link text. It's very important that you're honest with yourself when assessing the current state of your aptitude for accessibility. If you've never used a screen reader before, your first version of a checklist probably shouldn't have a line item for screen reader compliance. That's a standard that you can work toward as your accessibility prowess develops. All right, now that you've chosen a set of standards, it's time to decide if you want to build something net new or if you want to source an accessibility checklist. If you go to your favorite search engine right now and type accessibility checklist ADA, you're going to get a ton of results. There are checklists designed for beginners, checklists in different formats, checklists based on the type of content you're creating, and checklists designed for specific roles or scopes of work. This is a great place to start if you're just beginning on your accessibility journey. In fact, many, exis many existing checklists have support documentation that explain how to apply certain standards. This is extremely useful if you're working with a team of people that are at different levels of their accessibility knowledge. In my work, I chose to create something custom. By blending together my favorite aspects of different checklists, I created something usable for the design teams that I work with. Building your own checklist gives you autonomy to choose different standards you want to enforce, and it gives you some options on how you want to phrase that requirement. This will be especially useful if you're using WCAG because these standards can be really difficult to interpret. Let's take criterion 1.4.3 contrast minimum as an example. 
It states, the visual presentation of text and images of text has a contrast ratio of at least four to five to one. If you're new to accessibility, contrast ratios mean nothing to you. So this standard will be really difficult to assess. You could rephrase this for an accessibility checklist to state text and images of text are tested with a color contrast test checker and pass the test. This is a little bit easier to digest and gives them an actual tool that they'll be using to assess the specific standard. For the record, there is no one size fits all checklist. Whether you sourced it or built it, the important thing is that you choose a format that makes sense for you or your team. Which cues are third factor? User experience. An accessibility checklist is only as good as its user experience. And in my time, I've seen checklists that exist as physical papers, as PDFs, as forms, or automated workflows in Slack. I'll say it one more time, there is no one size fits all accessibility checklist. The format and accessibility of the checklist should match the needs of the end user. If you're the only user of the checklist, you have complete control over its format. Do what makes sense for you. But more often than not, you're creating a checklist for a team of people to use, and that's a bit more complicated. You'll need to decide on a few things. First, what technology will deliver the checklist? In other words, where is that checklist going to live? Locating the checklist in a separate system tends to reduce its use. So best practice is to house the checklist where users are already working. Consider if you want users to reference the checklist all the time or only for specific points in the design process. If the checklist is only for QA, then build the checklist into the QA documentation. If it's meant to be referenced at many points throughout the design process, add it directly to templates and outlines. Essentially, you are trying to make that checklist easy for the user to prioritize accessibility in their process of building something. The second consideration for creating your checklist is determining how the checklist should be structured. And there are loads of options here. One option is to create a single master checklist for all types of assets, all types of content. Alternatively, you can create specific checklists for different types of content. This is particularly useful if your team creates a variety of content types. Think about it. Accessibility requirements for an e-learning course are far more expansive than the requirements for a podcast. E-learning has interactives, videos, text, audio. A podcast, on the other hand, is simply meant to be audio with some accessibility supports from transcripts. So as you begin to practice accessibility, a single, a single checklist will more than likely do the trick uh, just to cover all sorts of content, get people practicing some of the same best practices. But as time goes on, and you and your team's skills grow, you'll probably want to align your checklist to different types of content. This will make their auditing and planning a little bit more faster and effective. The third decision you'll need to make is about the level of compliance. In many accessibility reports, there are four levels, not applicable, does not meet, partially meet, and meets. Alternatively, your checklist can be binary stating that either a specific design meets the standard or does not. Personally, I recommend starting with the binary approach, then shifting toward a more detailed approach once your team becomes more comfortable with the standards. The final decision you'll need to make is in regard to data collection. If you want visibility to trends, then you'll want to create the checklist in a system that records responses. A Google form will allow you to do that. And this is the system I've chosen for my accessibility checklist. Data is only useful if you have a plan for it. Personally, I like to use the results of the accessibility testing to create remediation. If I notice design teams are struggling with a standard like keyboard navigation, I'll use that information to create pointed communications and training. Data-driven checklists are great for organizations who are more advanced in their accessibility practices. Conversely, they may be overkill for teams who are in initial stages of applying accessibility. In summary, there are four decisions you need to make before you start constructing your checklist or sourcing one online. First, where will the checklist live? Two, how will the checklist be structured? 
Three, what is the level of compliance for each checklist item and how are you scoring that? And four, do you want this checklist to collect data? If you've made it to this point in the video, you've come a long way. There's obviously a lot to consider when onboarding an accessibility checklist, and I appreciate you sticking with me. I promise this is a practice worth pursuing for the sake of creating inclusive experiences. For inspiration, and just for fun, I'll walk you through the checklist that the design teams and I are currently using. This is the accessibility and inclusive design self-service checklist used at Salesforce for all design teams. What I've done is I've created the checklist in Google Forms so that I can have a data-driven view of what standards are being met and ones that might need a little bit more support in order to carry out successfully to ensure compliance. I have divided all of the different requirements based on the asset type that the learning design teams frequently create. Um, so everything from a document to a storyboard, a PDF, video, or audio, this is all included with standards that are specific to each asset type. So let's choose one of them, e-learning for example, and see what it looks like. One thing before I move on that I want to note is that I include resources for first-time users to make sure that they are successful in their navigation of this experience. So. Let me also make sure I check in for my email. So this is what the e-learning accessibility checklist looks like. I ask the user to name the asset that they're reviewing and if they want, include a link to it in our learning management system. I ask them to indicate if the asset will be uploaded to the learning management system. There is a back-end report I can pull to show which different assets, courses, and curriculum have been marked as accessibility compliant. So I will often cross check the data from this field or this question with that report. And then here are the standards or requirements, the checklist itself, if you will. Um, this is a simple binary one where it's either it meets the criteria or it does not meet the criteria. I do also have a field for not applicable because I don't want to create training around uh, standards that look like they're not met even though they don't apply to that specific learning. So without reading through every single one, these are all focused on text-based content um, and a user would go through and select them if the criteria is met or perhaps it doesn't apply in the situation and they would check not apply. If something is not met, they would also check that box. I have divided all of these into types of content. So the first one being text-based, the second one being interactive content. Um, so anything that the user has to interact with, like a quiz, like a um, hotspot in Articulate Rise, that is where these specific standards would come in. And then lastly, multimedia content. So images, videos, and audio, ensuring that they have accessibility compliant features such as closed captions or alt text, and that it all aligns with current best practice. Uh, these standards are often changed and the way that I communicate them is often changed just depending on my audience's feedback. Some people might not be familiar with certain terms here, so I try to create associated job aids so that they know exactly what I mean when I say something like audio transcripts. Lastly, I end with some next steps. So if there are any unmet criteria, I direct the user to a best practices slide deck where they can hopefully find information to mitigate any issues they run into. And at the end, they would submit. It's not going to submit right now because I haven't entered in all the information, but it would allow them to download a copy of their responses or have it emailed to them. And then it also saves on the back end in a report for me, which is incredibly useful to determine where we might not be meeting the mark in the realm of accessibility. I hope this overview was a little useful in defining exactly what the requirements look and feel is for your own accessibility checklist. As I close this video out, I want to communicate a vital piece of information. Accessibility evolves, and your checklist should too. Laws, standards, and best practices change frequently. Plan a review quarterly at the very least. Even if there have been no change in standards, ask if there's an opportunity to increase rigor for the checklist. Maybe you or your team are ready to prioritize keyboard navigation and screen reader testing. The end goal is to have a comprehensive accessibility testing that ensures the final product is usable for everyone. 
regardless of disability. Thank you for tuning into my toolbox tip. I hope this has been useful in taking a step toward creating accessible experiences for all. Thank you.